Hello, it's Jake here. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is part two in a series of episodes on the topic of unschooling. And in this episode, we talk about compulsory education, both in terms of what schooling is really about and our experiences of surviving it, and also some thoughts on the psychology of teaching. Special guests are Brett Vernot of School Sucks Podcast and Stefan Molyneux from Free Domain Radio. So thanks so much for listening, and on with part two. Boring is inoffensive, right? So if, if the parent teaches some sort of critical thinking skills that then puts the child in collision with social prejudices, I mean, I mean the acceptable ones, right? Uh, like statism or religion or whatever. Uh, well, then, of course, the, uh, the parent is going to get, well, whoever is offended is going to get mad at the teacher. And, and they get, so, yeah, they just they gravitate quite sensibly, given the system, they gravitate towards uh, mendacity, boring, trivial, unimportant stuff. Uh, that has no juice behind it because, uh, yeah, any kind of values, any kind of critical thinking, any kind of skepticism uh, is uh, is volatile. You don't know where the fundamentalist parent might be, right, of one kind or another. Or, or you know, who the kids are who have, like, uh, three male relatives in Iraq and you start talking about military-industrial complex of the war. I mean, you're, you're toast, right? And remember, too, that most of these people who go into this profession are, are products of the system as well. So... Uh, the first thing that happened to me when I, when I got a job as a history teacher in a private school, private school, 2004, was I was handed a copy of the Vermont State Standards. And, um, you know, it, it, through this process, through these 12 years, we learned that um, authority is the truth. So if this is the state standards, you know, uh, from the Department of Education, w- w- who would question that? You know, and, and I had had this... Uh, you know, this wonderfully inspiring professor in college, and, uh, you know, he turned out to be a socialist, as, as they do. But um, he, he really got me thinking, and he really sparked up my interest in the subject. And, and I had gone, and I had, I had created my own uh, curriculum for American history. And, and I wasn't, like, you know, making a big deal about rejecting the state standards, but it just was inconvenient for me at the time because I had this, this, all this other stuff that I, I wanted to do. But I think that um, most people, you know, they, they're given a, a script and, and they're willing to follow that script. So I don't think they are, most teachers don't have a, a, any malevolent intention. And I think most people get into this profession, even though this profession ha- certainly has a tendency to beat it out of them. Because they, they want to make a positive difference. They, they want to uh, help young people um, learn. And I think that as their career goes on, the more they realize about the system, about the school that they work in, about the curriculum that they're teaching, the more that, uh, the more that just kind of becomes a story that they keep telling themselves. But I don't think that they're conscious of any incentives against uh, fostering creativity or, or curiosity. Do you know what I mean? But you could say, uh, Brett, isn't it, isn't it possible that, I mean, in some senses, like, you might be quite unusual in that most people who want to become teachers um, probably have, you know, are actually more bought into the whole idea of, you know, the merits of compulsory schooling and the, and the system itself. I mean, I, obviously I know, like, my family, there's loads of teachers in my family. My mum was a teacher as well. And I know that teachers do complain about the system and about, you know, its effects. But I wonder if also actually, in some senses, it, it, it attracts people who, who believe in it in the same way that, you know, people who get involved in active politics ultimately complain about the government but do still um, sort of, you know, get involved in, in participating in, in the machine, so to speak. And they want to, they want to participate in the machine as like, uh, you know, dominating other people? Is that yeah. what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, like to, to give an analogy, right? Um, you know, there are many, many, um, well, socialists in particular, but other people who complain about um, this government, this state, uh, and they may even have the ideas of overthrowing it with a revolution and this, that, and the other. But they're actively involved in political life, right? And in doing, in being so, in encouraging voting, and in doing, you know, they, in a sense, they are actually 
just simply part of the of supporting the system um, by by participating in it. And I mean, I'm um, I'm just saying like maybe teachers may complain about the teaching system, but I bet they're probably more statist and 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 sort of more coercion oriented, you know, than maybe some other types of of, of people you know, more in, in the free market because. Because they are actually choosing to go into something that, that is quite a coercive situation, if you see what I mean. And, of course, as students, they probably experience it themselves. But what isn't it? You probably know this stat better than I do. Don't 50 percent of teachers leave the profession within the first five years? I mean, what is driving them at, you know? Um, I would, well, I, if I had, this is conjecture, but I would think that that's the time when, they have the most positive energy and, and uh, you know, the right attitude um, or they're most optimistic about this career. And it, it, I think very, very quickly. I mean, it took me, I, I was, uh, began teaching in a classroom in 2002. I was out in 2006. I had seen all so I needed to see. So you it's before their soul physically leaves their body, there's, there's still a chance. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically, I think that obviously the the bribe in in the education system, in the government education system, is tenure, and obviously all of the 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 wonderful benefits, the the pay increase guarantees that those can uh, keep those things can keep people stuck in that system and rationalizing what they're doing as it's unveiled to them. What, what they're really involved in or, or the damage in many cases that's, that's being done, well, what else could I do? Where, where else could I work, uh, you know, uh, 1,100 hours a year and make $60,000 and get a pension? And, and I think that uh, when I've talked to teachers, the resistance, the outrage, the indignation that I was met with when I started to really, really challenge uh, the roots of the system it was it was amazing. It was overpowering. I was almost punched once by the husband of a teacher who uh, who just lived locally, um, who took such offense to the things I was saying. But I have to kind of think that they they already know what's happening, and you know maybe that's some of the resistance, or that's some of the the outrage that oh other people know too, other people can see this too. Um, it's it's a real disruption to to the story. Uh, to the narrative that uh, most of these people have to agree on. I also think that uh, the statistics seem to be pretty clear that the biggest single determinant to success in school is the home environment. And I think teachers who really want to, you know, you see all these movies like Dangerous Minds and Stand and whatever, where they, teachers can really inspire the kids. And I think that there's some truth in that. I mean, there does seem to be some truth in that. But I think that... I think that somebody who has like truly stunning motivational skills can make a difference even in a very tough school. Yeah. But I think the majority, of, you know, there's a bell curve, right? So, I mean, that's true of teachers, I think, of anyone else. So there's a few exceptions. I mean, and they're so exceptional that you have to make movies about them, right? I mean, so that, that's an example of how exceptional they are. I say can, they can make a difference, but I think the majority of teachers who don't have that kind of motivational skill look at the environments that the kids are in and say, well, you know, how much can I really affect how much this eight-year-old who's dealing with X, Y, and Z at home, uh, how much can I really affect this person's capacity to learn? There may be a certain amount of, of that. And the statistics do seem to show that the biggest single predictor for success is not, not school district, it's not income, it's, it's just it's the quality of the home environment and the ded dedication of the parents towards uh, education. Right. Well, I think that, you know, especially once you start to... to uh, understand the idea of voluntarism. The, the the most essential first step is is getting involved uh, in the education of your children, especially if they're trapped in these um, in these public schools or even private schools. Um, but you know, I yeah, I mean, I I, I have worked in my career with a lot of um, uh, families in turmoil. Uh, I guess would be a good, a good way to say it. None of them were good students. None of them could could pay attention in school, and uh, none of them. I, I, that was you know that, but that was a measure of success when my career started. Do you pay attention to me? And you know, you use the word motivation, and just to tie this back to what what Jake said, teachers love to use words like motivation and inspiration. Um, you know, motivation is a very very popular term. All you know, K through twelve. 
so often when teachers are talking about motivation, and this was true for me at the beginning of my career, what, what they mean by motivation, what they mean by inspiration is compliance, right? Like I've planned all of these things that I think are exciting. Right. So you're going to be excited about it. And you're going to be motivated and I'm going to inspire you and I'm going to feel great about what's going on here. That is nothing more than a demand for compliance. And you'll be, it's the, the, the environment itself engenders this kind of, uh, you know, B.F. Skinner pop <laughs> behaviorism um, that I, I totally agreed with what Jake was saying because, yeah, that was me at the beginning of my career. I, I love to tell myself stories about uh, motivation and inspiration. And, yeah, I had just had a, uh, a college professor who changed my whole attitude about education, who changed my whole attitude about my um, intellectual abilities, changed my whole attitude about history, my least favorite subject in high school. So I was determined, you know, to, 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 to do that early in my career before I understood any of these ideas. But all I was ever really uh, wanting from anybody was compliance was to have a manageable classroom, you know, where people were excited and attentive about what was going on. It's like what they said about Stalin, that he was never so dangerous as when he was in a good mood. <laughs> exactly. Like whenever, whenever the dictator becomes enthusiastic, everybody runs for the hills. <laughs> right, right, right. I'm not calling you a dictator. But the, funny, that out. the funny thing is, Brett, that in some ways, like, it's not surprising that like you were almost it, it just by being the quote teacher in that environment where you have that room of you know students who you know you you're you you have this role of being the you know knowledge imparter who's going to be telling them what they need to learn um in that lesson you know it it sort of sets you up for getting into that um compliance kind of uh, idea in the first place and i i mean i think it's really interesting that the, the stats that Steph was talking about, about the number of teachers that, um, that drop out, because, um, I mean, in a sense, you, you also sort of, you, you dropped out of that system to go off and do like private education and other things, as far as I, as I understand. And a, a lot of other people kind of leave the, the uh, uh, state education system early on in, in terms of the stats that Steph was mentioning. And I guess the people who are left behind are the ones who, you know, are, um, and are not able to uh, or, or willing to um, sort of question that that uh, attitude in themselves in the way that in the way that you did. Right. All right. Well, really, you know, and I it's was really hard I... to teach people who you who obviously don't want to be there. I think it takes a certain kind of personality to continue to teach children who obviously don't want to be there and don't want to learn and stare at you resentfully and so on. And I think that weeds out a lot of the people who just they can't take it because they have some degree of human sensitivity. If that makes sense. Right. Right. Absolutely. I mean, if we keep uh, we keep trying to ask a woman now who doesn't want to go out with us, it's called stalking, but we don't think about that in terms of teaching. Right? Yeah, yeah. It, this is like enforced uh, compulsory to sort of uh, stalking where you're forced to stay in the same room. Yeah, it's a stalking that delivers the victim to you <laughs> in a bus. <laughs> Well, there's another idea, too, that helps these teachers kind of cling on to this profession, and that's the idea that it's something wrong with the kids, that the kids are defective. It's not anything that you're doing wrong. You have nothing to be frustrated about. You're doing your best. These kids have problems, right? right. And this is, this is they always, uh, it seems like, uh, I don't know how far this goes back, but really since the, the, the scientific revolution, for any form of, of oppression or subjugation that existed in the world, they always seemed to, to try to search for some kind of scientific backing for it. They did this with slavery. I've talked about this uh, uh, on my show in the past. Uh, some guy came up with this disorder called drapetomania, which was this slave's uh, compulsion to flee captivity. Because that, that's an illness. And then, of course, um, you know, the, the subjugation of women, the mistreatment of women uh, in the United States um, all throughout the 20th century was eventually they put this science behind it that there was these, these just these gender differences. You know, it's biological. And, of course, today it's young people with all these diseases like uh, or, sub, you know, supposed diseases like ADHD and um, uh, uh, oppositional defiant disorder, uh, which is basically the same thing as drapetomania, um, as, as far as I'm concerned. And so it's, it's always like they're, they're looking for this, the, you know, this science to, to uh, back up these um, systems of domination. 
And uh, I, uh, teachers buy into that. Again, if authority is the truth and psychologists are saying that this is why you're having a hard time, that, that gives them some, some confidence in their own abilities or that stick to uh, to keep going. Because, oh, it's not me. It's these kids. Right. Right. Yeah, I wanted to, like, uh, say something about the psychological impact. And uh, I, 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 I'm learning to sing and I also have a... A good teacher, but the thing is, she said that she basically has to, uh, and she keeps saying this over and over, basically that she has to deprogram almost every uh, student that comes to her because everyone is so afraid to make mistakes after you know after going through all the years of uh, compulsory education that people are freaking terrified, you know, to uh, to try something and, and to and to make mistakes and she has to like explain on and on and on that nothing bad will happen and yeah and, and that people come to teachers uh to try <laughs> to do their best to to make mistakes and, and to improve but the fear is so you know deeply ingrained in them that that is a real struggle for for her to you know to get people deprogrammed from that kind of stuff right yeah, that's a great point, actually, yeah, Ivan. I, I remember just how much of a risk aversion kind of atmosphere there was in schools, and everyone was terrified about actually having coming, coming up with some creative idea or, or even putting their hand up sometimes to answer a simple question. And I think that, that kind of fear of being able to express oneself and ask questions um, that the school system cultivates is actually part of what leads to the boredom and monotony because no one can kind of step out of line or, or challenge the curriculum. It's just this is the sludge that you have to put up with. And I can remember that feeling in schools of just that, that absolute claustrophobic boredom, um, but no one being able to kind of say anything about it. And that was what was so horrendous, like thinking, oh, I've got to come in tomorrow and then the next day and the next day and then how many years in advance. And that was just kind of crushing. And so, um, I can, yeah, I can completely understand when I, when I was doing music lessons, um, I had a similar experience where uh, the, the guy teaching guitar was sort of saying that, um, you know, trying to get, get people out of that, that habit of just looking to repeat back information rather than actually try to enjoy and become engaged in the experience itself. I remember when my brother was learning guitar uh, at home, uh, he didn't go very far in it, but the, he would get so nervous before the guitar lesson that the, I remember the guitar teacher actually suggested he take a shot of liquor before, <laughs> before the lesson so he could relax and enjoy it a little bit more. You know, in my opinion, of all the, the horrific things that the, the state you know, forces people to do, uh, the, the public education system to me is just... Uh, it's, it's just mind blowing. It's just so brutal and, and barbaric. It's just to put children in these these horrible indoctrination camps for over a decade. It just, you know, it's it's mind blowing. So I think getting the information out there is is so um, so important. It's just just the core topic. I think. I I absolutely agree. I think it's the right message for uh, the the right target audience. When I say school sucks. Yeah, great. But school's already done most of the work for me, you know, in convincing young people that that's true. It's just explaining to them, hopefully, um, you know, attracting them to to this show uh, ultimately attracts them to to the larger message because the, the, the school sucks part is easy. I mean, the, all the momentum towards accepting that idea, it, it's pretty much already that, that project is already complete. Yeah, you're not, uh, you're not but, having to sell anyone the idea that school sucks. Right, right. Or very, very, very few people. And I know that in Keene, New Hampshire, when they went to the school and um, uh, held up signs that said school sucks, uh, it seems like the kids were interested in uh, pleasing their teachers. So they would come over and try to uh, challenge the, the free Keene people uh, and, and argue that they liked school and school was good. And it was actually, it was kind of a, it was kind of a sad thing to watch. Um, but that does they sound kind of tragic. Yeah. They, they saw that, uh, their teachers were having like a very strong reaction to these, uh, to these activists. So they went over to try and convince them that they actually all did like school. Now this was middle school, uh, where, you know, you show up at seven, 30 a.m. with a 45-pound backpack and you fill out worksheets all day. And somewhere in there is gym and uh, some macaroni and cheese. 
And, and you're trying to, I mean, w when you're 13 or 14, you, you don't, you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. So you don't know, maybe you don't even know how bad that really is. Maybe that just seems so, so normal that um, th you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, the sad thing is that, you know, it wouldn't just be the, the uh, teachers that they would be challenging if they did, um, you know, if they did uh, sort of, uh, embrace that message because obviously you know as we were talking about earlier it would be potentially challenging uh, the parents too because uh, the parents you know probably are big fans of the school and may well be um, you know uh, involved in sort of telling them how, how, what a great thing it is that they go there yeah yeah, and also uh, I expect it, it could be even the case that, you know, children are just going to have a distrust of authority generally and they're not going to have a clue what these activists are up to. It's going to be like, well, there's some sort of people over there, possibly crazy, who are obviously angry about something and they want to educate kids another way or whatever. I mean, I don't know if that's the case in that situation, but it's just a thought that crossed my mind. I think there's, there's just a general great distrust of um, for kids, understandably, of, of authority anyway. Well, I mean, school school is a 35 hour a week positive affirmation for the status quo. So when you when you go to school that much and when you're that trapped in that system and you see a group of people holding a sign, those people are holding signs. Those people are crazy. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you right, know you look right, at right. It, right? like people, people who hold signs in March and, um, uh, you know, have a cause or are passionate about something. That's uh, that's just bizarre behavior. That's that's not. Uh, an affirmation for the status quo, and that's not what they're learning. So that that I I, I could see how they're I could see why they reacted the way they did to what they were doing in Keene. Right. Uh, yeah. So I, I was wondering, um, having been sort of involved inside uh, education, inside the, the school system, and so on at, at various times. Um, What's your uh, opinion and views on the way that um, the way that cl the classrooms are, are, are sort of managed, uh, and the kids are kind of um, sort of let? Uh, there's a kind of a chaos to the classrooms that I remember, where I was afraid um, partly of the teachers, but mostly just bored by them. Uh, I was actually afraid of certain groups of, of children. This brings into, you know, the, the whole um, kind of, uh, the, the classroom is the anarchy and it must be quelched and there must be an authority and all this kind of stuff. And it's almost where we're taught slave on slave violence again is inside the school system. I was just wondering if you, your experience in that, because it's really difficult, because obviously I, I look back in school and I don't uh, sort of blame the very young kids um, in the same way that I hold the teachers morally responsible of being in charge of that situation. But um, I just wondered, have you, have you experienced that in the school system? And what, what are your thoughts and views on that and, and the kids and how they kind of uh, yeah, would all sort of attack each other in that environment, much like in a, a prison system? Uh, is this a question for me? Well, I guess it's an open question, but, oh. but I suppose for you, because you've had some, you know, uh, you, you've got a great deal of insight in this and you've, you've sort of gone and worked within this, the system. So... Yeah, it's funny that for a while I, I was, you know, especially most of the time that I spent working in um, in these environments, and of course all of the time that I spent as a student in these environments, I was totally puzzled by this, and I just knew that, uh, especially in middle school where where I was bullied, uh, it was just something that you try to avoid. You know, you just stay out of this hallway at this time. But what Thank what you. You really became clear was that uh, this seemed to be the natural consequence of forced associations. People, people bully each other and mistreat each other in schools, just like you said, like they do in prison, uh, just like they do in, uh, in, in the military. Uh, you know, this, this, this even happens as far as these negative interactions are concerned. This even happens in the workplace because I think a lot of people ha have started to feel like, uh, you know, they're trapped in their jobs. Uh, that they have to work with these people. They hate their job. They hate their coworkers. And, and we even see, you know, a lot of these negative interactions in the workplace, you know, amongst adults. Um, but I, I think that that's the root cause. Uh, oh no, it's not the root cause. But it's what it's what uh, the school environment is. What you know incubates all of this stuff that happens uh, at home in childhood, related to related to parents. When you mix everybody together into this forced environment, into this forced associations, you're going to see the worst uh, of people a lot of times. 
Um, and uh, what do we call that? Socialization. Uh, I, I, that's what that's what comes to mind, uh, you know, right off the top of my head. But uh, classroom management, uh, you know, another another thing that I think creates tension in school is uh, is competition for these rewards that um, are dangled. You know, the other thing, the competition for rewards too is um, rewards. I, I think that. People people think that punishment and reward work because in the short term, they appear to, right? But all rewards are are instruments of control. They, they buy the reward or punishment giver uh, temporary compliance. And, and I think that, you know, just like with the state, uh, when the argument from authority fails, when the argument from fear fails, when those arguments lose their potency, all you uh, are left with as you kind of you know, cling to this tenuous power uh, as bribes, you know, carrots and sticks. Uh, but but uh, the, the long-term uh, damage, even though it appears to work in the short term, it's really just about control. And I think that, um, I don't know, I'd be interested to see what people think. Is, is all of these instruments of control, is that creating or a, a desire in these young people to to kind of, you know, turn around the, the bullying they're receiving from adults in the school. Are they, you know, turning around and, and carrying out the same kind of negative interaction or so, with with uh, their peers because of that? I don't know. Well, it certainly, you know, immediately gives children the message, the psychological message that you are in a world that works by coercion, you know, and that might is right, basically. You're here because, you know, we can basically force you to be. And consequently, you know, it, it follows logically like, oh, well, if I'm in a world that works by coercion, then, uh, you know, if I'm bigger and I can get away with it, then you know, I, I can use it to achieve ends. I can use that to achieve ends. So certainly, you know, for me, it, it appears like that it... it uh, it's got to be a psychological underpinning. And, of course, that starts earlier with the parenting as well. But, like, for me, I mean, it's interesting, Luke, what you were saying about your experience of school. It's, it's very true. It, for me, too, my main, the main problem I had with school was violence from other kids, was, was bullying. The teachers were boring and irrelevant, um, but I never had any, any violence from them or anything like that. The, the big problem was that um, was you know the experience that I had you know being trapped in that environment with uh, with violent kids, but I understand that their behaviour was following on from from the uh, the the kind of basic rules that they they were in in that system that was set up with coercion itself. Yeah, and, and actually further to that, um, I remember some of the teachers actually using the kids who are kind of like the bullies and the, uh, you know, in, in the kind of aggressive groups that, that picked on the other kids, actually using them to their advantage to sort of, quote, help them manage the rest of the class in a really kind of sadistic way. Remember, using, they're, they're subtly using tactics like that because a couple of teachers, they couldn't actually handle the, the classroom because who, who can handle, you know, classroom full of 20, 30 kids? It's crazy. And eventually, unless they're just going to openly use violence or something, um, they, they're going to lose control. And, and I remember in classroom, this constantly kind of, it would be quiet and then it will, the noise would go up and people would lose interest and then you just get shouted at and it would go back down. And then it would come back up again, you get shouted at and go back down. And the teachers would actually use um, the kids, they would give the, uh, the bullies sort of leeway in certain situations. Even though the, the kids would talk back and give the, the teachers a lot of lip, they, they would give them leeway because they were, would attack a lot of the other kids who were out of line, like wanted to ask questions or put their hand up or were trying to actually get on in the classroom. But it would kind of keep other people in line. And I always remember that thinking, wow, that's, that's particularly cowardly and, and, and a sadistic way of, of keeping quite order in the classroom. Yeah, I, I just wanted to raise the point that... Um... The bullying that I suffered really, it, at the hands of my peers, it was physical bullying, like people beating me up or threatening to beat me up or both. Um, but at the hands of the teachers, there was always like emotional abuse. And in this situation where they're trying to like get a class full of kids to be quiet, 
Man, I could tell you some stories. Like, there were these two teachers in particular. My maths teacher's approach to this would be to flip out, to literally jump on the table and shout at everyone uh, to get them to quiet down. And so it would literally ape-like. I had another teacher, an English teacher, who would bring in a whistle, who'd swear at the kids, like, really loud, and, you know, other teachers could hear this, and blow a whistle, like for ages just like i think i counted it at one time he blew a whistle for two minutes straight like taking breaks to breathe but he kept doing it just to make the point that he's louder than everyone else it's complete yeah what the fuck exactly it's, uh, it's it's completely insane but that that's the the environment that engenders this kind of madness is uh, an environment that's that's underpinned by coercion so it's not surprising looking back that these things happened, but in the moment they were pretty bewildering um, uh, and and just horrendously abusive to suffer. <laughs>